Hello everyone, this is my Memory Palace presentation presented for Dr. Brickle's Studies in Hebrews class. This Memory Palace is going to follow the road that I would walk nearly every day from my apartment in Malta down to the bus stop to go over to the main island or to go into town to do grocery shopping or whatever I needed to do. It was a, a path I walked, like I said, pretty much every day. So I have quite a few landmarks around along the way. And so when I saw this Memory Palace presentation, this was what I thought of, was connecting these these pieces of the book of Hebrews to this path that I that I walked every day. So we'll start here at my apartment. This is going to represent Hebrews chapter 1, and we're going to associate that with this image of an anchor. So Hebrews chapter 1, the introduction to the book, is the anchor to understanding the rest of the book of Hebrews. Here the author establishes the centrality of the identity of Jesus Christ to the rest of the book. So everything that happens from this point forward is tied up in who Jesus is. He is the radiation of Yahweh's glory, the expression of his character, the creator of the universe, seated in glory at the right hand of the Father. Everything going on is, is wrapped up and can't be separated from understanding the identity of Jesus Christ. The first landmark is this corner right here where I'll turn and go down to the bus stop. So this corner is going to be Hebrews 2 verses 1 through 4 and is going to relate to this image of a set of headphones. Hebrews 2 1 through 4 is a call to the audience to listen to what's being said and a warning against the perils of not listening. So again and again in these verses, the uh, there's this language of orality that's echoed the the author says listen to the truth the message that was delivered through the angels salvation was announced by the lord jesus and it it was delivered by those who heard him speak and god confirmed the message so there's there's this this definite this definite picture that you get of of listening and the importance of hearing what's really going on as the author continues this exposition. The next <clears throat> the next landmark is right here, this pizza stop kiosk it's called. And this is going to be Hebrews 2 verses 5 through 18 and connects to this picture of a, a man in a question mark. Through these verses, Hebrews 2 5 through 18, the author kind of has this underlying theme where he's wondering and explaining at the same time who are we he echoes the psalmist sentiment from psalm 8 what is man that you are mindful of him who are we he goes on to explain how jesus tasted death for us jesus identified with humanity he became the perfect leader he makes us holy and this all of these sentiments culminate in this expression that jesus calls us brothers and sisters our identity as the church, or the, this audience's identity, just as the identity of Jesus is, is pivotal to understanding the book of Hebrews, so our identity is wrapped up in, in Jesus. We are because he was. We are called, we are sent out because Jesus was sent, because Jesus was called out and set apart for a purpose. So there's this this inextricable connection between the identity of Jesus Christ and our identity and the identity of the audience. The next landmark is this old bus stop right here, no longer functional, but part of an old bus route. And that's going to connect to Hebrews chapter 3 and this image of a pair of worn out shoes. So Hebrews chapter 3 is the first of the comparison chapter saying Jesus is better than this Jesus is better than that and in this chapter Jesus is better than Moses and in and in that same comparison there's a parallel being drawn between the nation of Israel and the church and, and the audience that's hearing this so the author tells us that Moses was faithful to the how to the service of the house of God he was faithful to the mission that he was given but it tells us Jesus is better than Moses because as Moses was faithful to the mission, Jesus is the establisher of the mission. And so the people of Israel 
when following after Moses, they rebelled. And because of their rebellion against the mission and against God's command to them, they were doomed to wander the wilderness for 40 years, never being able to enter into the rest that had been prepared for them into the promised land. And so that, that warning goes out to this audience as well, that if they reject the leadership of Jesus Christ, who is better than Moses, then they run the risk of wandering in a spiritual wilderness and never being able to enter into the rest that's been prepared for them, either now through the gift of the Holy Spirit or in the future through the promise of eternity in heaven. The next landmark that we're going to come to is over this way just a tiny bit actually. It's this playground and there's a little fountain and some rocks down behind it. So those rocks for me were a place of a place of reflection and just being in the presence of God while I was in Malta. And so I'm going to connect those to Hebrews 4 verses 1 through 13 and to this image of a spa, of a place of rest. So Hebrew, the end of chapter 3 began by addressing this concept of rest, but here in chapter 4 he really begins to explain a little bit more what he means by rest. He connects rest to the creation narrative to, to let us know that this rest was prepared from the very beginning of creation. This narrative of reconciliation through Jesus Christ was never a backup plan, but this was always what was to happen. And those who have entered into this rest through faith in Jesus Christ, they have they found a, a repose from the stringent requirements of the law that base salvation on what someone does or doesn't do. But again, at the same time, the warning is issued that rebellion will remove us from that rest and that, and that God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He knows what he knows what we think, he knows what we feel, and the only way that we can enter into that rest is through the way that he's prepared. The next landmark that we're going to come to is this sign right here. It says Merba, which is Maltese for welcome. And that's going to relate to Hebrews 4.14 4, through Hebrews 5.10 and this image of oil. This is the first of the passages explaining uh, the, the high priestly role of Jesus. And, and this is the passage kind of laying out his qualifications to be high priest in a sense. So Jesus can be a high priest because he identifies with the suffering of humanity because he identified with the with the weaknesses and with the with the limitations of humanity and because of that he is qualified now to be our high priest because he understands our weakness because he understands our suffering through him we can find grace and help and unlike the earthly priests who who could only roll sin forward for a year, because of his perfection, he was able to become the perfect sacrifice and provided for eternal salvation, who could forever satisfy the debt of sin that we incurred. The next landmark that we're going to come to is right up here. It's this set of, uh, this set of colorful benches. And that's going to relate to Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 through Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. So this passage is, uh, the author kind of begins to show a little bit of his frustration with the audience at this point. See, a lot, in their spiritual journey at this point, they should be fulfilling their missional responsibility to teach others uh, what they have learned. But they're still at the point where they're having to be taught the fundamentals of who Jesus is. So this is connecting to this image of a baby bottle because they haven't grown and they haven't matured beyond that point. And at this point, like we talked about, the identity of Jesus is the anchor to everything that happens in the book of Hebrews. And they're not even really at a point where they understand that yet. They're at a place where they're not growing, they're not moving forward, and there's this warning from the author, you've got to start growing. You can do it, but you've got to start growing. Continuing on, the next landmark that we're going to come to is going to connect to Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 to Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20. So these verses deal with the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. So uh, this landmark is going to be um, this this set of steps right here that go down 
to the seaside and that's going to connect to this picture. I've always loved pictures of uh, flowers and plants growing in weird places but to me this picture represents the same hope that's represented in this passage. So our, our hope is an assurance that we have that through that th that God's promises will be fulfilled through the f the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. We have uh, our hope allows us to enter into the holy place to go to the other side of the curtain. So as the veil was torn at the crucifixion through Christ's sacrifice, we have hope that our relationship with God is no longer based on a priest's annual sacrifice, but we've been saved eternally through Jesus Christ. That's the hope that's, that's offered through that relationship with him. And that's uh, Hebrews chapter 6 verses 13 through 20. So moving on to Hebrews chapter 7, uh, and that's going to connect to this image here of some Olympic medalists, first, second, and third place. So, and we'll we'll stop here at this Bubbles Dive Center as the landmark for that. So this this chapter deals with kind of this. Uh, it, it deals with this comparison. Melchizedek is better than Abraham. Jesus is better than Melchizedek. So. It starts out, and it's this really interesting look at Melchizedek, uh, and the question is posed, if the priesthood of the law, if the earthly priesthood works, then what's the purpose of bringing Melchizedek into the story? What role does he play? He is there to make the point that the early priesthood isn't enough, that Aaron and Levi are in the Levitical priesthood is not sufficient for what the priesthood needs to be. And so that priesthood that's established through Abraham, Abraham was submitted to Melchizedek. And, and so, and then moving on, Jesus is better than Melchizedek. So that earthly priesthood, the law doesn't work because the priests died, but Jesus's eternality makes his sacrifice eternally beneficial. His sinless, blameless, unlimited by humanity that nature makes him perfect forever and establishes him as a permanent high priest. The next landmark is this place, Ristorante Il Gambero. I always wanted to go eat there and never took the and never got the chance to, but we're going to relate that to Hebrews chapter 8. And that's going to join with this image here of an old computer. So Again, the central thought here is that Jesus is, is Jesus' identity, that he is a high priest. But this new covenant replaced what was old and out of date. What was considered so effective at one point is, is now just a shadow and just a glimmer of the brilliance of what is to come. We needed something better than that priesthood because the rest that God has provided for us under this new covenant, that eternal rest, is better than the rest that was offered through the old covenant. And so, we were in need of this new covenant. And that's where that, that thought comes in that that old covenant is obsolete. The next place that we'll stop is right up here. It's a little courtyard area that I would always stop because when the water was coming up really high, it would splash over these walls and out into the street. And we're going to connect that to this image here of a quill and in ink. So, and that connects to Hebrews chapter 9. So in this chapter, there's a comparison and a contrast of the two covenants. See, the strict instructions and detail of the first covenant reveal to us that entrance into the presence of God is not free and open as long as that's the covenant in place. But that system was just a placeholder until something better could be established. So now there's this new system. There's this new agreement that's been made and confirmed by the blood of a perfect sacrifice. And now we've been ushered into this new agreement that overshadows the insufficiency of the tabernacle and offers us permanent access to the presence of God. The next landmark is right here, this Bank of Valletta. That was the ATM where I would go to get out uh, cash every month to pay my rent and all of that. So that's going to be Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 18, and that's going to connect to this picture of a man eating nothing but broccoli. So uh, this ch this passage deals with the fact that the that the efficiency of the first covenant relied on the priest doing the same thing day after day, year after year. That consistency was what was what offered salvation, was what rolled their sins forward a year, and without that consistency that salvation was lost. But the efficacy of Christ's priestly sacrifice lies in his eternal identity. And so one offering was enough. Under the old covenant, 
sin was only pushed forward but with this new system it's removed is this restaurant called yummy yummy and that's going to connect to hebrews 10 verses 19 through 39 and is going to relate to this image of a climber holding on to a rock so this passage is a is a call to to hold on to the hope never let go of that hope never forget the hope that you have through Jesus Christ never stop meeting together remember how excited you used to be how you suffered for your faith and accepted it with joy when your hope kept you going don't lose your hope don't lose your faith in God and you will receive the promise just persevere only punishment uh, awaits those who knew the truth and then gave up but the faithful ones will be saved the next landmark then where where we're going to stop on this uh, memory palace is right here, this place called Pebbles Cafe. This is going to connect to Hebrews chapter 11 and to this image of some trophies, but we'll come back to those in just a second. So Hebrews 11, arguably the most familiar passage in the entire book, filled with story after story of men and women who lived by their faith, who made tough choices based on their faith, who chose unpopular and uncomfortable paths because of their faith. But despite their lives of faith, they never received all that God had promised. They never experienced the hope that we have. They never knew the rest that we know. They lived by faith and only ever got the consolation prize. So coming back to these trophies, I think of these not as a bunch of trophies, but just as a bunch of participation trophies because they lived by faith. They did everything that they knew to do, but still they never received the promise they never received the complete fulfillment of the promise, but still they never wavered in their faith. So the next landmark where we're going to go is <clears throat> one of <clears throat> one of my favorites. It took me down a side street. Hold on just a second here. All right, so here's the next landmark right here, this ice cream stand. And we're going to connect this to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 13, and this image of a cross. So this passage, it's a continuation of the thought that's begun in chapter 11. So, And we often think of these first verses, seeing where uh, come past about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, cast aside every the sin that does so easily beset us. We think of this passage usually as something encouraging, but this passage is meant to be convicting. This passage is meant to say, if all these people could live by their faith and never receive the promise, why are you even thinking about giving up? Up. lay aside everything else keep your eyes focused on Jesus and keep moving forward but as we go on it begins to talk about the discipline that God offers to his children the discipline that he gives to those he loves and it, it's a call to accept God's discipline not as a punishment for doing wrong but as challenges to the flesh to keep us to keep the audience doing right choosing to share in Christ's suffering hence the image of the cross it is the the Bible tells us take up your cross and follow after him choose to share in that suffering choose to accept that discipline hold on tighter to your faith hold on tighter to your hope that's been uh, hold on tighter to the hope that you have through Jesus Christ and just keep going the next the next uh, landmark we're going to stop at is this rock sculpture right here. This is the next to last, and again, this is going to relate to that, that same picture of that set of earphones. Because Hebrews 12, 14 through 29, it mirrors that warning that we read in chapter 2 about the danger of not listening. So again, the author reminds his audience of the necessity of listening to the voice of God. 
he he lays out for them the the differences between their encounter with the voice of God and Israel's encounter with the voice of God at Mount Sinai and lets them know even though your encounter with the voice of God isn't as terrifying or as dramatic as Israel at Mount Sinai no one is saying that you ha that your animals have to be stoned if they touch the mountain but listen because your punishment for not listening is even worse than the punishment that they experience and then our last stop through the book of Hebrews and on this tour is the bus stop where we come. The conclusion. And this is going to be an image of a map. Because Hebrews chapter 13, in, in a sense, is it feels a little random. It feels a little piecemeal, kind of like it doesn't really belong. It's just a string of, of, of instructions that don't really seem to relate to everything else. Honor marriage. Respect your leaders that have, that have spoken to you. Uh, it, be, be kind to, to strangers, for you may be entertaining angels unaware. All of these these kind of disjointed thoughts that don't really seem to flesh together or meld with the rest of the the rest of the chapter but what happens in chapter 13 is that Hebrews chapter 13 is a reminder of where we've been called to go and a reminder of what we've been called to do. It, it tells us that just as Jesus went out of the went out of the city, so we must go out of the city to spread the gospel, to spread the good news of what he's done. It's a call, it's a reminder of what the audience has been called to do. We are looking, it, it, it reminds us that this world is not our home. Where we are now is not our home. We are looking for another better home, hence this image of a map. So that is the end of this memory palace and, um, <clears throat> and this look through the book of Hebrews. Hopefully you enjoyed this and got some insights into this content. Thank you so much. God bless.